Welcome to Cycle Talk. On this episode, we've got Harley Davidson Sportster 883 Iron. We've got Kawasaki 650L Vulcan, a new learner approved cruiser. We've got a Ducati 851 Classic. But to kick it all off, let's get into the KTM 1050 Adventure. Now, last season we checked out KTM's 1190 Adventure and 1190 Adventure R. And those bikes were great at doing exactly what their name said, taking you on an adventure. They were the only two bikes or adventure bikes that KTM had in its range at the time. Now they've added two more, the 1050 Adventure and the 1290 Super Adventure. Now both the 1050 and the 1290 are at either end of the spectrum, sort of. In the middle with the 1190s, they're more aggressive off-road type machines and the 1190 Adventure R that you see down there comes fully equipped with 21 inch front wheel and knobby tyres straight from the factory. But you might say that these are more road based. We've got the 1050 entry level, which we're going to check out this episode. And next week we're going to delve right into the 1290 Super Adventure. KDM's adventure bikes have been very popular with Australian riders over the years. Now when they brought the first V-Twin 950cc version out, sold like hotcakes. They then got bigger, they got better. 990cc, then 1190. But KDM also realised that not everyone wanted the harder edged adventure motorcycle. That's why the 1050 now exists. No one could accuse KDM's V-twin engines of lacking in horsepower. But this bike has got less horsepower than the rest. It's got just under 100, where the next bike up in the range has got basically nearly 150. Now, what does that sort of make in the real world? Does it make much of a difference? Not as much as you would think in my opinion. And basically this bike has more than enough horsepower for the job at hand. The 1050 Adventures C height is 850 millimeters. Now that's 10 millimeters lower than the next highest one in the four bike range. And this is helped somewhat too by the fact that the travel of the suspension is the lowest. And it's got 185 millimeter suspension travel on the forks, 190 millimeters in the shock. KDM uses WP suspension in all of its adventure bike range. And this bike is, I guess you might say, the most basic of the four adventure bikes from KDM, and as a result, has the most basic suspension. Now it's got 43 millimeter upside down forks, no adjustment. The shock absorber on the rear has got adjustment for preload and also rebound damping. The 1050 Adventure also shows its road bike bias by the fact that it wears cast alloy wheels. It's got a 19 inch front wheel, 17 inch rear and road biased tyres, a 110.70 on the front, 150.70 on the rear. Now let's have a look at the technical side of this monster. It's got ride-by-wire throttle. As a result, this allows KDM's engineers to give the bike traction control, and it's also got ABS. Now both of those can be switched off. There are four riding modes. You've got sport, street, rain, but there's an optional off-road mode. And each of those modes has its generic or default settings when it comes to power and traction control, for example. In the optional off-road, it goes even further. It changes the ABS as well. So you really got a lot of different packages that you can cater, or which will cater, for pretty much every sort of road or off-road situation. So we're here with Paul Bailey, who's been testing the 1050 Adventure for Cycle Tour. Paul's a very experienced rider, ridden lots of adventure bikes. So, Paul, what's your take on this bike? It's a very capable machine. Its pedigree with um, off-road racing over the years obviously shows through with a motorcycle. Um, and the, the 1050, um, even though it's probably the, the cheaper version of the ones that are available, it's a very, very nice motorcycle. So this bike's got a bit less horsepower than uh, the, the others in the range. And it's smaller capacity, of course, 1050cc now. Uh, do you think that the horsepower is um, a positive or negative? I think it's a positive. Um, it feels very strong. It's got great power right through the whole rev range. It's not ridiculous power that's going to get yourself in trouble. Um, these bikes aren't a sports bike, but they're meant for a, you know, spirited riding. And I think it's a nice balance between the power and the size of the bike and the suspension. I think it works really, really well. So have you been able to try some of the different riding modes? Yeah. Gave the turned off the traction control on the dirt section we come along, that was quite nice, the power is really good for that. Um, it's not ridiculous where it's stepping the rear end out too hard, it's just nice and controlled. Uh, quite nice in that respect. Uh, ABS, same thing, turn that off and just 
use the brakes as, as normal, felt quite good as well. Um, and on that dirt section we just came along, it was uh, very confidence inspiring. Now, I guess the roads that this is designed for, you'd have to say we've been on them today. Yeah. And uh, how have you found that the suspension has worked considering there's no adjustment on the front, but there is adjustment in the rear, you, you know, we know that's part of the budget side of things of this bike, but, you know, how have you found it? Yeah, well, it's, it's built for a budget, that's for sure. But the front forks are very compliant. It feels just as nice on the road as it does on the dirt. Um, again, it's road tyres that we're trying to ride the bike on some fairly loose gravel dirt sections, so that's a bit of a challenge in itself. But with the rear suspension being adjustable, at least you've you got that scope to be able to control uh, two upriding, luggage, that sort of thing. You, I found it nice and balanced. It was, uh, it's right on the money. Who do you think the bike's aimed at? I think it's aimed at that guy that just wants to get out and travel. Um, the guy that enjoys sitting upright, enjoys a background of, of trail bike riding, that type of thing. Uh, maybe sports bike uh, is not his thing. He just wants a bike that's, that's going to give him a nice relaxed ride, offer him the power that he needs, the braking that he needs, and a level of handling both on-road and off-road that um, um, he can be confident with and enjoy. And not be afraid to, as we did today, stop and see some dirt roads leading up and decide to go up those roads and, and have a look around. So there you have it. KDM has got a great range of adventure motorcycles, but this is the entry level, both in capability and in price. And I think it's going to suit a lot of different riders. And this is a great entry level adventure bike from KDM. A KTM 1050 Adventure will set you back $17,995 plus on-road costs. Talk to your KTM dealer. You can win an awesome Contour Rome 3 action camera with Cycle Talk and Contour. Just go to cycletalk.com.au slash contour to enter and sign up for the Cycle Talk email newsletter while you're there. The Contour cameras will be won every week and we'll announce the winner on next week's show. Fearless innovation starts with an attitude. While others claim to be ahead of the curve, we're already leaning into the next one. We're about setting the precedent year after year and letting the rest play catch up. They ride to keep up with today. We ride to own tomorrow. Kawasaki's Lambs range is one of the biggest around. Naked bikes, adventure bikes, sports bikes, and now even cruisers. Not every fresh-faced motorcycle learner wants the same thing. And with cruisers being so popular at the moment, it makes perfect sense for Kawasaki to build the 650cc Vulcan S. Using the same 650cc parallel twin cylinder engine as seen on the Versys and EF6 models, the Vulcan is one of the more powerful and bigger capacity learner machines on the market. Kawasaki's designers have made the bike adjustable in a few areas, so it's perfect for just about all sizes. The forward mounted foot pegs can be repositioned forward or backwards. The pullback handlebars can be rotated fore or aft. It has a low seat of just over 700 millimetres, so even if you are short on leg length, there shouldn't be too many issues manoeuvring this bike around at low speeds. It weighs in at 226 kilos, a tad more with a tank of fuel, which is 14 litres. A fuel capacity of 14 litres isn't great in today's language, but we are finding we're getting over 20 kilometres out of a litre, which should get you probably over 300 kilometres out of a tank, which I think is pretty good. The frame at first glance looks pretty similar to the other Kawasaki 650 varieties, though it has got a different steering head angle and a slightly different swing arm. ABS is standard and there's a single disc at either end. On paper, the brakes could be better, but they do a decent job of stopping the bike. And with cruisers, you tend to use the back brake more than you would with a sportier machine.
There's plenty of accessories available, including two touring kits. The medium-sized touring kit has the panniers, the rear rack, and the larger touring kit has the same panniers, rear rack, and a windscreen. The suspension is basic unadjustable forks and a single shock, which has preload adjustment. It copes with most things well enough, but on pretty rough roads, you are gonna feel it. Kawasaki's done a great job with its modular lambs machine. The Vulcan S is a cruiser style that so many people are after. It's got a great engine and provides plenty of power to kickstart your two-wheel career. And what does this style and street cred cost you? Well, under 10 grand plus on-road costs. Cycle Talk's next series will be shown in the spring and it's going to feature my tour of the USA that I'm doing in June. Now, to make a really good tour, it's best to have local knowledge. So I'd like your experience, your ideas, and any contacts and friends that you might have in the cities I'm going to, to help me make a great story for Cycle Talk on TV and in the magazine. I'll be starting my tour in Milwaukee at the home of Harley Davidson. Then it's on to Chicago for check out the gangster museums. Then it's on to the Motor City, Detroit. Now here's a place where they built all those wonderful American cars of days gone by. From the Rust Belt, I'll be heading up into Canada and across to the Niagara Falls, where we'll pass back into the USA. Then it's on to Rochester, the home of the former giant of the film and photography industry, Kodak. And I really want to get to the Kodak Museum. From there, I'll be pointing the Big Harley South, heading to New York, the Big Apple. Been there once before. It's an interesting place, and I'm really keen to get back and have another look. While I'm on the road in the USA, I'll be posting pictures to Instagram, I'll be updating our Facebook page, and I might even be getting onto Twitter when I can. So you'll be able to keep up to date with where I'm at and what I'm doing. So if you've got some friends in the USA, I'd love to get in touch with them. They might end up in an Australian magazine or on an Australian TV show, which I think will be really, really cool. So email usa at cycletalk.com.au or post something onto our Facebook page and let us know where you think I should go, what you think I should see, and who you think I should meet. And I reckon with a bit of help, we'll be able to make a really, really interesting trip through the USA. Back in the late 1980s, I was in my early 20s. I thought I was fast and I wanted a Ducati 851. They were simply the duck's guts. They were not just a beautiful sports bike, they were very successful on the racetrack. They handled superbly. They had performance of a V-twin that eclipsed a lot of four-cylinder bikes. However, when the first ones came out at $23,000, it was genuine fantasy land. And apart from the price, the bike had a few other things that sort of put me off buying one in those days too. All the early models only had a single seat. They were very difficult and therefore very expensive to service and maintain. Touring amounted to a toothbrush and a credit card. So there was a lot of things that prevented me from ever seriously considering buying a Ducati 851 brand new. But once I'd got a chance to actually ride one a few years later and realised what they could do and how well they could do it, well, I knew I'd own one one day. This one came up and it was, had been sitting in a, in a shed for a number of years and the owner had taken it to a, uh, to a Ducati specialist to have it checked over and, and serviced and brought up to a point where it could be sold. Both Chris Pickett was, uh, was interested and so was I. And that's it, this became the Ducati 851 owned by Cycle Talk, and we've had this for six or seven years. This one is a 1991 model. By that stage, they'd grown upside down forks on the front end. This one has a, a pillion seat, and it's a bit more civilized in, in some ways than the very early models. In fact, the very early models had 16 inch wheels, which were still sort of fashionable in those days, uh, but they were quickly dumped in favor of 17s that we've been running on road bikes ever since. There's something 
about the Ducati 851 that really epitomizes why it's such a beautiful motorcycle, it's not just the appearance, it's also the sound. Because if this bike isn't the best sounding sports bike you've ever heard, well, I don't know what planet you come from, because this thing, with its really deep rumble and relatively high revs from a V-twin, is just simply glorious. After we'd had it for a little while, Chris decided the frame needed powder coating. The original white frame was looking a bit ordinary. I tried to talk him out of it because I'd read far too much about the complexity of these bikes and how they're assembled that I knew it was going to be a nightmare job. But he was insistent. He didn't think it'd be too much of a drama. Thought it'd take a couple of months. 18 months later, we had a motorcycle we could ride again because it is an absolute nightmare to work on. In fact, one of the big the big um, headline uh, features of the bike that replaced it, the 916, was that it was a lot easier to work on. It would actually cost less to maintain than an 851. But that 916 would never have existed if the 851 hadn't been the success that it was. Not just in showrooms, not just on racetracks, but also by capturing the hearts and minds of a whole new generation of people that would end up loving Ducati. We've got a new Multistrata 1200 coming to Cycle Talk. We're going to have that for some time, and that will be a big feature of the third series in, uh, in, the, in the spring. And that's the sort of bike that Ducati have sold off the back of a lot of the racing success. Yes, their sports bikes are very successful. The Panigale is wonderful to ride. But at the end of the day, a company like Ducati doesn't make a, a living and doesn't become the big big company that it is based on race replicas and, and full-on sports bikes such as the Panigale or the 851. It makes it through its reputation. And the machines that, that were born out of the 851, from the 888, which is really just a, a bigger engine 851, to the 916, to the 999, to the 1098, to the 1198 and now the Panigale, were all born from those days back in the 80s and the 851. If you want to get a hold of one of these, they're still around. They're not a million dollars, but they're not cheap. They are very finicky with, the, with, the, uh, with problems, with things like the regulator rectifier, and this one's playing up right now. So there's another job that we have to do. Um, we've done a sprag clutch. We've done a little bit of engine work. It's a delight to ride. It's a bit of a pain to own, but I love it. It's a, just a wonderful motorcycle. It really represents part of the history. And one day I'm probably just going to park it, never ride it again because of all those little issues that you get, unless we can find somebody who can really look after it and maintain it without it costing me a fortune. But the Ducati 851 is a sport classic like no other as far as I'm concerned. This week's winner of a Contour Rome 3 camera is Robin Dixon from New South Wales. You still have a chance to win your own Contour Rome 3. Just get to cycletalk.com.au slash contour and enter now. Stop dreaming and start riding. Your motorcycle adventures start at ProCycles. Graduate to a BMW for pure riding pleasure. Ride a Triumph with classic heritage styling. Add some KTM excitement on the road or dirt. Compare Suzuki's huge range in store. And when it comes to ProCycles service centres, they've been doing it right for 40 years. First time or next time, make it happen at ProCycles. Hornsby on Sydney's north side and St Peter's in the south. Come back to Graham Boyd Motorcycles to check out Yamaha's range of accessories, this time the ones for the MT-09. So the luggage system available for the MT-09 from Yamaha is quite extensive, saddlebags and the tank bag. So with the tank bag, it goes up to 15 litres expandable, so it holds a fair bit of stuff without being too bulky and getting in the way. It's got pockets on the side, it's got a little back pocket here with a media access, so if you want to run a set of headphones up, you can. It comes with strap. And to use this tank bag, you need little this ring, aluminium ring that mounts onto your fuel filler cap, and it gives you very quick and easy access to take the bag on and off the bike. 
which makes filling it up and, and just taking the bag away very, very simple. Uh, the tank bag itself is $2.45 and the ring $45. At the back here, we've just thrown the throw over saddle bags over the back of the bike. Now, to use these, you need the fitting kit, which comprises a few little bits and pieces. So once you've mounted this up, these metal stays come away from the, uh, from the mounting kit quite easily. So if you're not using the bike with, uh, with the saddle bags, it's not making it look like it's all set up for touring. The bags themselves are expandable up to 21 litres each side, and they've got a side pocket on them as well. So very versatile, very useful. They, they're literally throwovers. They've got handle, handles to carry them around if you're off the bike. They go on and off the bike very, very quickly and easily. Very easy to use. So the setup to mount them, the stays, is $169, and the bags themselves, $329. If you want to make the back end of your MTA 9 look a bit sportier, get a rear seat cowl. So this covers up the pillion seat. Sporty appearance, stainless steel mesh in the back here. Just two little holes to bolt it on, and that just goes over the back. Colour matches the bike, whether you've got the black or the silver. If you're going touring on your MTA 9, you might want to replace the standard seat with something a bit more comfortable, Yamaha's Comfort Seat. So this has been designed for more long distance touring and better comfort for both rider and passenger. $378, very easy to fit, you just take the old seat off, pop this one on. Clean up the look of the front of the MTA 9 with the black polycarbonate fly screen, MTA 9 logo on there. Sits up in here, breaks the wind a little bit, but most of all, makes the bike look sportier and better. If you're interested in going touring on your MTA 9, this could be the most useful accessory of the lot. It's a big rear rack, goes on the, on the back of the bike. It's $249, and that's die-cast aluminium, and it even incorporates grab rails for your passenger. It's fairly easy to mount. You do have to get underneath the bike and modify that up a little bit to, to get access to the bolt holes before you can bolt it on but it's not too bad, and it's the sort of thing you could leave on the bike permanently. It also accepts the optional top boxes without any further modification or, or hassles. Protect your MT09 with these frame sliders. Nylon and aluminium, anodized aluminium, they have the MT09 logo on them, and they're designed to fit the bike perfectly. So they mount up really easily, they look great, $325. For those looking to really increase the performance, style, and reduce the weight of their MTA 9. Yamaha, in conjunction with Acropovic, have produced this titanium racing exhaust. It looks absolutely fantastic. It'll reduce the weight of the bike. It's made from stainless steel with a titanium sleeve, and can't think of a better way to make your MTA 9 perform better. Now, it's closed course use only, so it's too loud for public roads, but it will sound really, really good. If you would like a bike that gets you from A to B without fuss, without bother, with lots of fuel range, with lots of comfort, with no vibration, don't buy one of these. This is the Harley Davidson Iron 8A3. You don't buy one of these for practical reasons. You buy one of these because they're fun to ride and they look awesome and owning it is more an experience than it is a form of transport. So this machine is the baby of the range, 8A3 cc's, so it doesn't have heaps and heaps of power, it doesn't have heaps and heaps of torque, but it's got enough for normal street use. So it fits into that category of being a fun machine that is really aimed at the urban use. So who's the 8A3 iron for? Well, I actually think this bike suits someone who might own a big touring bike or a big adventure bike. Something that you don't want to get out of the shed just to ride down to the cafe and have a coffee with your friends. Because this bike is the complete opposite to those. Those bikes have lots of luggage capacity, they can carry two people, you can go long distances, but they're unwieldy in traffic. They're not that much fun in at slow speeds. Whereas this bike is. It's a lot of fun in those conditions. It's a great bike around town. Riding it up a winding road along a beach, fantastic. That's what this bike's all about. It's about the riding experience. 
and of course, anybody who wants to start modifying up a Sportster. Or of course, you can just go to the Harley Davidson catalogue, start buying lots of bits and pieces, bolting them straight on yourself, easy to do, build yourself a custom motorcycle and do it reasonably cheaply and you can come up with something that is unique, it's different, it's fun to ride and if you do have that other big bike sitting there in the garage, very different from that as well. A few practical aspects of the bike. Tank's 12 and a half litres, get you a couple hundred k's between refills. If you do need to carry a passenger, you can get a passenger seat, you can get foot pegs so you can turn it into a bike to carry a passenger pretty easily from Harley. The brakes, single disc at each end, they work okay, they're ABS equipped. They do look really cool in that red paint. It really contrasts the rest of the motorcycle. And talking of paint, the paint on the tank and the guards on this machine is beautiful. This metal flake looks stunning. Five different colours available and they all look really good. The bike vibrates a lot, it shakes. You really know you're riding a motorcycle that's very old school. Even though it's a modern bike, it's very old school. The riding position is fairly upright, which is really quite comfortable up to 100 kilometers an hour or so. And it also suits the handling too. The bike's pretty easy to turn into corners, although it's a fairly slow steering machine. So in really tight stuff, you, you, you notice it there. Now the suspension's fairly short travel as well. That keeps the seat height low, goes in well with the styling of the machine. However, rough roads aren't as comfortable as you, as you might hope for. So that Iron 883 comes in at under $15,000 right away from your Harley dealer. Now that's pretty good value for money for the Harley and it's a lot of fun to ride. It's something that's different and most enjoyable. Fairly unique in what it does and how it does it. That is I think what keeps them selling, it's what keeps them unique. A lot of people love them and you might just too.